Happy Red Friday, everybody. It's Eric with Low VA Rates. I hope you're wearing red. Why do we do that here? If you've listened to us before, you know it's because we love our veterans. Red stands for Remember Everyone Deployed. I wish it stood for Remember Everyone Who's Ever Served, which is basically why we wear it. We just want to show an outward expression of how much we are dedicated to just supporting the military. So wear red every Friday. Do this with us. Speaking of red, look down to the right of your screen. There should be a red button that says subscribe or follow or like. We want you to know when these videos are coming live so that you can share them. Share them on your own social media. Send them to your veteran friends and family. We like to push out really good content every Friday. Today, we're going to talk about income qualifications for self-employed borrowers trying to get a VA loan. Okay, so self-employed and VA loans. You know what's awesome about military veterans? They're such hard workers. They've learned through their military experience what, what hard work and dedication and risk taking does. And so we get a lot of self-employed borrowers. There's some risk involved in being self-employed. It's a lot of hard work, I'll tell you that. There's a lot of benefits too. It can be more difficult, however, if you're self-employed, it can be a little bit more difficult getting a VA loan. We want to help you out with that. Okay, that's what this video is all about. We're going to tell you now some of the extra legwork you have to do and what you can do to get yourself ready to get your VA loan, even if you're self-employed. And you might say, well, how do I know if I'm self-employed? Basically, if you're not getting a W-2, okay, no W-2, if you're getting 1099s at the end of the year, if you're starting your own business, self-employed is really anyone that's not a wage earner or an employee of a company. So let's just, let's just establish that. So what do you have to do? The most important income requirement that you've got when you're self-employed is a consecutive, I'm gonna put this up here in big letters, consecutive two years history. So let's just say you just got out of college, you wanna go out and start your own business and you've only been in business for six months, you're killing it. You're making more money than you ever thought you would. It still won't matter because for a self-employed borrower, you have to establish two consecutive years of financial consistency and stability. Keep that in mind. Two years, very important. Um, you gotta understand when you're trying to borrow money, it could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that you're asking low VA rates or any other VA lender to lend you. And we've got to know that even though you're killing it six months into business, that you're going to be able to pay us back over time. And that's why that two-year history is so important. It allows us to see your financial patterns. It allows us to make an informed decision about whether or not you're going to be able to pay us over the next five, 10, 15, maybe even 30 years. So look, a lot of veterans used to work in an industry that is similar to the business they go out and start. Let's just say you're an amazing car salesman and you've been doing that w 2 for some local car dealership forever and you go out and start your own car dealership. Even though it's the same industry, it doesn't matter. You need two years of consistent self-employment at that company that you're starting. Okay, second thing, another very important thing to remember and to prepare for if you are a self-employed veteran. So not only do you have to have two years of consecutive self-employment, that employment over those two years needs to remain, I'm gonna use fairly, stable. So back to this example of you starting your own car dealership. Let's say year one, you crushed it. You sold more cars than, than you ever thought you did, but then COVID hits in year two, everybody clams up and stops buying cars and the income drops by like 50%. You might think, well, but I made four or five times what I needed to in year one, but in year two, you know, crap just hit the fan, but I still made pretty good money. You might not get qualified for the loan. That's one of the risks in self-employment. Who's to say in year three, it doesn't get even worse. So a lot of this sporadic up and down is not good. If it decreases just a little bit, that's not something to worry about. I would say normally speaking, if your decrease, is 25% or less, then that's okay. I know as a self-employed person myself over the years, the income's gone up and down and up and down. It's just those massive swings 
Well, we don't ever care if there's a massive swing up. That's just a benefit to you and it makes it easier um, to put money away and save money. But it's that sporadic up and down that can make it a bit more difficult to get approved for a loan if you're self-employed. Now, what we normally do is we'll calculate your average monthly income by adding year one and year two together, coming up with a total, and then dividing that by 24 months. That would then be your monthly income that we would say you make. Now you might say, yeah, but one month I made 10 grand. Doesn't matter. We take a two year kind of um, average, okay? But if your income decreases on year two by more than 25%, it's likely that we're only gonna be able to use that second year and take our average from that. So let's just say again, you made 200,000 year one, year two, you took a big dive. You only made 50,000 in year two. You might say, okay, Eric, but if you add those two up, that's 250,000 divided by 24, that's close to $10,000 a month. We can't do that because there's been more than a 25% decrease over the first year. So what we'd have to do is take the 50,000, divide that by 12, and now you're under $5,000 a month. It still may be plenty of money to get approved for the home you're trying to buy, but it's not nearly as nice as the average between year one and two, and I hope that makes sense. Now, another requirement is going to be documentation, okay? We've talked about income consistency or, or employment consistency and stability. Um, your income better not have a bunch of up and downs. You also need to understand there's going to be extra paperwork or documents. Nobody likes paperwork or documents. It's part of being self-employed. Now, if you're a regular wage earner, you normally send in two years worth of W-2s and one month's worth of pay stubs. Pretty simple. But if you're self-employed, we're gonna need a lot more information from you. Here's what we're probably going to need. Two years, that's that magic word there, two years, tax returns. And tax returns can be 50, 60, 100 pages in some cases. And not only do we need your personal tax returns, but we need both personal and business tax returns. Some self-employed borrowers might have numerous businesses. It can become somewhat daunting. Get with your CPA. Most business owners and self-employed people have someone helping them with their taxes. If you do, then you're gonna to wanna to get a CPA letter. I know I'm kind of all over the whiteboard here. I'll try to keep your attention. CPA letter, that's basically just a short little letter from your CPA that says, yeah, Mr. Veteran or Mrs. Veteran, um, I've been doing their taxes for the last few years, the last two years, five years, however long it's been. They're in good standing and they're self-employed. Just a simple letter from your CPA. Profit and loss statements. Okay, now if you've done tax returns, why would you need, we refer to these as P and, oh, P and L, profit and loss. Why would you need those? Well, it would be for the year in which you haven't finished. So for example, it's 2020, it's September. Well, we're gonna need a P&L profit and loss showing whether or not you're making money this year or losing money this year. It's not an official tax document. It's just a profit and loss statement that most businesses should have on hand or that CPA I referred to could create for you. If you've got stockholders or partners in your business, we don't see this often, but if you're a big dog, and you've got stockholders and partners in your company, you're gonna to need to, likely gonna to need to give us a list of all those stockholders and partners. There could potentially be even more. That's just the, the, the nature of the beast, so to speak, when you're self-employed. But here's what we're gonna promise. We're not gonna ask all of this stuff just to make your life difficult. We ask for all of this up front and we educate you with these videos so that when our underwriters finally get to the point where they're underwriting your file, we've got almost, if not everything we need to evaluate the level of risk that you would be if we gave you a loan. It's just part of the process. It's one of the downsides, if you will, of being self-employed. There's a lot of upsides. We just don't want you to get frustrated. Let me grab that pen. Just don't want you to get frustrated. And if you know this stuff up front, you're more prepared, you're ready to rock and roll. Now, the final income qualification you need to know about is it's only your taxable income that we're going to count. I learned very, I learned the hard way when I first got into business for myself, there's all sorts of benefits in being able to expense your miles and write your car off and basically take all of your income and chop it way down so that you can pay as little in taxes as possible. That sounds great, right? But keep in mind, I keep using the word killer today, but if you've got this killer income, 
and it's your gross income, okay? Got this killer gross income, but you wrote all this stuff off, all your travel, all your food. Now, I'm not a tax guy, not giving you tax advice at all. Just know if you took a $200,000 in killer income and you wrote 175 of it off in expenses, you're only gonna have $25,000 of taxable income for us to consider. That's not a lot of money and that's gonna be very difficult to buy a home. So if you're thinking about buying a home in the next couple of years and you're self-employed, consider what you're willing to write off on your taxes because it could come back to bite you. However, the good news is some of these write-offs and expenses can be added back in. Again, this is basic tax information. It's not advice, but you can add back in your depreciation. Those miles that you've written off can be added back in. Portions of your meals and entertainment can be added back in. That's all the underwriter's job, not my job. But if you'd like a more complete list of what you might be able to add back in so that we can count that as count that with your income, I'd start discussing that topic with your CPA. Let's wrap this all up. While income qualifications for VA loans are more strict and time consuming if you're self-employed, it's only because both the VA and automatic lenders like low VA rates want to make sure you're not getting into a home that you cannot afford. What a tragedy, travesty nightmare that is when a veteran goes after the American dream, gets into a home, when they shouldn't have been qualified for that home to begin with. It's just a mess when you can't make those home payments. So rest assured, low VA rates, we know what we're doing. We do loans for self-employed veterans all of the time. I hope you found this video useful. If you have questions, ask them down in the comment section of the video, and we love having interaction with you. We'll see you next Friday, and we hope you're wearing red. <laughs>